Um, now, here in the East End, there's a street, which I'm sure some of you will know, which is called Broom Street. And I want to take you for a moment back to Broom Street in the 1930s. Because in Broom Street in the 1930s, thousands of people queued every night, their children in one arm, a saucepan in the other, and they were queuing outside the soup kitchen for the Jewish poor. And at the same time, as thousands of Jewish people from the East End were queuing outside that soup kitchen, on the other side of London, um, there was somebody standing on a platform. He was an immaculately dressed, charismatic politician, and he was addressing a crowd of nearly 10,000 people in the Albert Hall. And at that meeting, he condemned the Jews as the nameless, homeless, and all-powerful force which stretches its greedy fingers from the shelter of England to throttle the trade and menace the peace of the West, grasping the puppets of Westminster, dominating every party of the state, the enemy which fascism alone dares to challenge. Now that smartly dressed man was a former Tory and Labour MP called Sir Oswald Mosley. And um, so think about those two events side by side, you know, this, he's saying that the Jews are running the world and on the other side of London thousands of them are queuing up outside the soup kitchen. Um, his full title was Sir Oswald Mosley, the sixth Baron of Ancoats, and he had been tipped as a future leader of the Labour Party, but by now when he was making that speech, he was the leader of a paramilitary political organisation, the British Union of Fascists which, as I'm talking and reading to you, I might abbreviate to BUF or Black Shirts. But BUF, Black Shirts, British Union of Fascists, we're talking about the same thing. He entered Parliament as one of the youngest MPs on the Tory benches, but by the late 1920s, he was a key thinker on the left of the Labour Party, and he was associated particularly with the independent Labour Party. He saw the economic crisis coming, maybe more sharply than most, and he developed a series of proposals to deal with that economic crisis. Um, he had some interesting solutions. He advocated nationalising a lot of the industries. He advocated um, putting unemployed people back to work in public work programmes, pulling down the slum housing and putting up decent housing. He advocated paying money so that children could stay longer in school um, and also have proper pensions for old people, so old people would not still be needing to feel they had to go out to find work to make a living, and that way you would actually contract the workforce, so when unemployment hit, it would actually hit a smaller number of people. And these, you know, you might think are all quite sound, social democratic, left of centre solutions, but one of the clues to where Mosley was heading was what he thought about imports and exports. He had a very ultra-nationalist, um, protectionist import-export policy, and which, had an at which seemed to suggest an attitude of caring about England, but not caring so much about people um, from other countries in the world. Um, between 1929 in 1931, unemployment rocketed from 1.5 million to 3 million. And if you think about the fact that we had, there was a smaller workforce then than we have today, um, that was a very significant part of the workforce. It was around 20% of the workforce unemployed. And in some towns in Britain, a majority of workers were unemployed. And when Mosley's proposals for dealing with unemployment were rejected by and ignored by the Labour Party, he turned his thoughts to a new political project. And my book, Battle for the East End, looks at that political project and how it came to impact so heavily in the East End in the mid to late 1930s. Now, loads and loads has been written about Oswald Mosley. People find him a very fascinating character. Um, I draw my own conclusions about him in the book. But 
he's not my inspiration for writing the book. Um, the inspiration for the book and the purpose of the book is to tell the story and celebrate the story of those dedicated and courageous people who actually suffered most from the attentions of his movement and to tell what they did to change their reality. And over the next 30 to 40 minutes or so, um, I'll tell their story and dip into the book and read a few excerpts. Um, in February 1931, Mosley left the Labour Party. He denounced the old gang politicians of all mainstream parties and he set up a new political party. And when he left, this cartoon was published in Punch magazine. And it's um, an interesting cartoon. It's Mosley counting the unemployment figures and he realises he's got to add one on the end, um, which is him, because he's out of a job now. Um, but he doesn't stay out of a job for long because the day after he leaves the Labour Party, um, he launches a new political party. Now, I don't know if anyone in this room has ever launched a new political party, um, but one of the difficulties is finding a suitable name, especially when a lot of the good names have gone, like Labour, Liberal, um, Tory, and, you know, you've got to find a name. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I don't know if he got totally kind of frustrated with trying to find the, find the solution, but he, rather unimaginatively, he named his new organisation the New Party. Um, but the new party, he said, was different. He said it, it wasn't like the tired old gang parties. He said it was a party of action based on youth that would mobilise energy, vitality and manhood to save and rebuild the nation. And it was the precursor to the British Union of Fascists. But that came a year and a half later. And to understand Mosley's trajectory, I think the new party period is well worth studying in depth. And I've got some parts of the book that particularly focus on that. Because when he set up the new party, people didn't know, was it a new party of the left or the right? Five Labour MPs followed him into the new party. A number of independent Labour Party activists followed him there as well. But there was something very chilling and very menacing about the language he deployed in his first few articles in the new party's paper, where he wrote... We must create a movement which aims not merely at the capture of political power, a movement which grips and transforms every phase and aspect of national life, a movement of order, of discipline, of loyalty, but also of dynamic progress, a movement of iron decision, resolution and reality, a movement which cuts like a sword through the knot of the past to the coming of the modern state. We stand for the New England. And as for what kind of state this modern state would be, he says it would be coordinated, cooperative and controlled, as compact and conscious, self-conscious as the human body, no dead limbs and no parasites. Um, it was after he visited Mussolini in January 1932 that Mosley's path towards fascism was concerned was confirmed. Mosley knew that his ideas were going to provoke opposition and that when he spread these ideas people might respond in quite physical ways um, to that and he started to build his own physical defence force which was known as the Biff Boys and the Biff Boys were trained by two sportsmen and in many ways those sportsmen were opposite. One was a man called Peter Howard who was an Oxford-educated rugby player, um, in fact, captain of the England rugby team at the time. The other was a boxer from the East End, who was known locally as Ted Kid Lewis, but like all boxers, they have these uh, pseudonyms. Uh, my own grandfather, Sid Clark, was known as Kid Stanley of Allgate um, in, in his youth. But Ted Kid Lewis, his real name, was Gershon Mendeloff. So Mosley was employing um, a Jewish East End boxer as a, as a bodyguard and training his physical defence force. And that also tells you that Mosley's anti-Semitism wasn't fully revealed um, that early on. Um, and that new party evolved into the British Union of Fascists in 1932. And when it 
launched itself as a party, it didn't mention the Jews or anti-Semitism. What it mentioned was it, it, it stood for a kind of ultra-nationalism, it was against communism, and it promoted a Mussolini-style corporate state. But if you went a little, scratch the surface a bit, you'll see that the seeds of anti-Semitism were there too. Mosley held his first public meeting nowhere near the East End. In fact, he didn't come near the East End until late 1934. That's when they had their first branch here. Um, his first public meeting was in Farringdon, in the city. And there was about 50 people there, including three hecklers. And um, those hecklers at the end were violently removed by his Biff boys. But in the meeting when they heckled, Mosley didn't deal with them through violence. He tried to deal with them through sarcasm and through ridicule. And he said, what have we got here? We've got three warriors of the class war. And then he added for good measure, and all of them from Jerusalem. And it was a completely gratuitous reference to the ethnicity of these three, who may or may not have been Jewish. Um, Mosley's party had cross-class appeal. In different districts, he tried to get different people supporting him. Cotton workers, miners, small shopkeepers, farmers, the unemployed, and particularly unemployed ex-army and navy. He was very keen on people who had been in the armed forces. In London, though, although Mosley came to be associated with anti-Semitic terror in this area, for the first two years, he was only in, in London, he was only interested in the West End, not the East End. Um, and the, the person whose support, and he was only interested in the West End, in the ultra-rich, and the person um, whose support he, he most wanted, I'll show you a picture of him. Um, this, on, on these images up here, um, got Mosley in full, full flow there, people advertising deodorant down the bottom. Um, and um, then in the top right-hand corner, there's two people with moustaches. Um, you'll probably recognize the one furthest from my, my hand. But the one nearest, near and nearest to my hand, was the person whose support he really treasured. And that was, um, that was Lord Rothermere. Lord Rothermere of the Daily Mail. The Rothermere family still own the Daily Mail. And for the first six months of 1934, Mosley's movement had the full support of the Daily Mail, such that in January 1934, it ran a big double-page spread which, was, which said, hurrah for the black shirts. And just imagine if on Monday you pick up the Daily Mail and it tells you the Conservative Party there, yesterday's people, um, the people that are really worth supporting now, the English Defence League, you know, BNP, there, and this is how to join them. Well, you know, if you imagine that happening on Monday, that's effectively what happened back in the day um, in 1934, in January 1934 because this article in the Daily Mail, it said that, you know, we need a new political movement to be holding the reins of power, and it's the fascists who we need. And it was urging every young man, they, they, Rothermere's politics on, on gender were not that brilliant, um, uh, it had urged every young man uh, to join up to the British Union fascists. In fact, Mosley was very proud that women were involved in his movement at all levels, from the ideologues through to the people stuffing their envelopes. Um, and, but with Rothermere's support, for the first six months of 1934, the fascists grew from a few thousand members to 40,000 members. 40,000 members. And they had 500 branches up and down the country. So they were a force to be reckoned with. And they were very well connected with people with a lot of money and a lot of power. Um, and, but an anti-fascist movement started to mobilise, including in the East End of London. And in the face of that growing mobilisation of the anti-fascist movement, and also Mosley overstretching himself and also behaving not so well when he overstretched himself, he actually blew the support of his movement. And 
A key moment in the history of this story happens two years before the Battle of Cable Street, in 1934. In 1934, with support from the establishment, um, Mosley tries to have a series of large-scale public indoor rallies, and his movement plans to have three rallies. The first one is going to be in the Albert Hall in April. The next one is going to be in Olympia in June. And the next one in White City in August. And each one would have a bigger audience than the one previously. So he does the Albert Hall meeting for about eight or 9,000 people in April 1934. And, it get, and he comes onto the platform, people listen in complete silence, and then, every so often, the silence is broken for rapturous applause when he says something they particularly like. And he's, he speaks for 90, 100 minutes without notes, and he's seen as a very impressive speaker, and even those newspapers that are not particularly pro-Mosley are bigging him up and saying what a, what a significant speaker and significant figure he is. So he can be very proud of how that first meeting went that year. The only newspaper to pick up on um, some of the things he said, actually, was the Manchester Guardian. The Manchester Guardian, as it was known then, the Guardian, picked up a little, little bits of the anti-Semitism that was said that night, which the Times, the Telegraph, and all those papers completely missed. Come, but the next meeting he wants to hold is at Olympia, 15,000 people. And the, and 15,000 people included 150 members of parliament. 150 members of parliament actually went there out of interest to see what this guy was about. Some members of the House of Lords got dressed up for the occasion wearing black shirts. Um, there were people there, the captains of industry that he was trying to attract to his movement were there. People, some very, very money people. There were tickets for the meeting at all different prices. So workers on very low wages could buy cheap tickets, but you could also buy very expensive tickets, and those expensive tickets were snapped up by those who arrived in Daimler's and Rolls Royces and wearing evening dress, thinking it was a society occasion. Um, and um, one of the anti-fascists at the time wrote, Mosley's got the millionaires, but we've got the millions. Um, and, um, but also, there were some people in the building who Mosley hadn't reckoned with, and they were the anti-fascists. Now, the anti-fascists organised a noisy demonstration outside the meeting, um, which the Daily Mail wrote about in very interesting ways. They described the people inside the meeting as the best representatives of the British nation. Um, they described the anti-fascists outside as a disorderly mob, mostly composed of aliens. Um, and uh, but inside the meeting there were anti-fascists. Anti-fascists had got tickets for the meeting. Now, one of the ways they could get tickets was that the Rothermere papers ran a newspaper competition, a letter writing competition, and you could win a pound and also a ticket to a Mosley rally if your letter was published. But your letter had to start with, why I like the black shirts. Um, that was the only proviso. Um, and, uh, and some anti-fascists wrote spoof letters about why they liked the black shirts and managed to get tickets for the meeting. And then they were able to reproduce some more tickets. And so the anti-fascists were dotted around the room. And when Mosley started to speak, three minutes into his speech, somebody in the room stands up and shouts out, down with Mosley, down with Mussolini, down with Hitler. Fascism means hunger and war. And sits down. And then three minutes later, somebody in another part of the room that's the same thing. And then this is happening like clockwork every three minutes until the stewards move into action. And at some point in the meeting, Mosley gives a signal and the stewards, there's 2,000 stewards in black shirt uniform, mostly men, but about a quarter of them women, uh, move into action. And when a heckler stands up, uh, they, that heckler would be surrounded by about 20 black shirts who beat the living daylights out of them inside the meeting hall and um, that they were beaten up further in the corridor around the room and thrown down the stairs and out the building uh, with blood pouring from them. And about 80 people got hospital treatment that night. And Mosley 
took the gamble of behaving in this way in front of the people he was trying to impress. And it failed, because um, lots of the people, <laughs> the very moneyed people he had been trying to attract, um, although they agreed with his politics, they did not want to be associated with the violence. And over the next four to eight weeks, it wasn't immediate, but over the next four to eight weeks, people of that ilk are backing off from Mosley. And it was bad news for Mosley, but it turned out also to be bad news for the East End. And the reason why it was bad news for the East End was because in the autumn of 1934, with support among the rich and powerful waning, the British Union of Fascists decided that in London it would now take a populist message to the working class communities of London. He, he wasn't so concerned with getting the support um, of the rich. And, uh, and in fact, its first um, East London branch was established in Bow. Uh, that picture on the right is from Bow. They are not fascists, but that's just a picture of a working class community um, in Bow. And that was the first place in the East End where Mosley um, had a base. And one of the first activities of that movement was to march from Bow towards the Jewish areas of the East End. And it was reported in the fascist newspaper, and I quote from it in the book. And in the fascist newspaper it says, the black shirts marched in procession from Bow Branch premises into Stepney Green, where a large crowd of people had gathered, which later increased to well over 1,500. The black shirts had a very noisy reception, as the larger part of the meeting um, were aliens who resented British people holding a meeting in what they considered to be their own territory. And, um, the, and in their newspaper they tried very often to say that the more Jewish areas of the East End were alien territory and communist territory. Now the fears grew among the local Jews. Um, the fascists themselves seemed surprised at how readily their message was absorbed by the locals. A year after the Bow Branch was formed, one of their leading writers wrote, The most surprising phenomenon in the growth of British fascism is the great popular support we have gained in East London. We are winning wholehearted adherents because we have preached a cause and a system bringing hope and sunlight into lives darkened by long years of hunger, squalor and despair. Because we have shown them a way to cast off the foreign yoke of a domineering, all-pervading Yiddish culture which strives to make East London take on the character of Odessa or Warsaw. But think of those words, hunger, squalor and despair. And think of what still drives people into the arms of the fascists today. It's not just hate. In the book, I mentioned the respected local churchman, Father Grosser, who spoke and wrote at the time about the terrible housing problems locally and the crushing effects of unemployment. And Father Grosser wrote about the frustration of personality, the loss of proper self-respect, the creation of an embittered and hopeless section of the community. And that hopeless and embittered section of the local community including me, included many among the previous immigrants, the Irish community, and they were ripe for recruitment by the fascists, who promised to restore their dignity, empower them with a renewed sense of identity and purpose, and give them a traditional scapegoat to blame. And Mosley had a good track record as a politician, when he was a Labour and Tory politician, of standing up for Irish self-determination, condemning the black and tans, Although when, as a fascist, he spoke to Protestant audiences in Edinburgh and Liverpool, he promised to free them from papal domination. Um, now, Mosley took his time to develop a full-blown anti-Semitism. In 1932, he said, Jews who were loyal citizens of Britain had nothing to fear from fascism. In then in 1933, his party talked of good Jews and bad Jews but after a while it mainly concentrated on those they considered bad. Um, the violence at the Olympia meeting 
diverted the headlines away from the content of his actual speech. And in the actual speech, he castigated the other political forces, the socialists, who he says drew their inspiration from the German Jew Karl Marx, the conservatives, who were inspired by the Italian Jew Benjamin Disraeli, and the liberals, admiring that typical John Ball, Sir Herbert Samuel. And so he's basically accusing all the political parties, the mainstream political parties, of being run by the Jews. Um, in the West End, Mosley graced platforms in the Albert Hall, Olympia, Earl's Court. But in this area, and in the neighbouring borough of Hackney, the political platforms were less elaborate. They were soapboxes for street corner speakers who would whip up an audience of hundreds into a frenzy, and with Mosley's approval, they would take the anti-Jewish rhetoric one step further, not only attacking Jews for alleged crimes and misdemeanors, but for what the Jews were in a racial sense. And I want to read a section from the book here about this. So this is from 1936. A popular BUF speaker at open air meetings in Stoke Newington in 1936 called Pipkin was fond of declaring those who are uh, those that those who oppose fascism are not of our flesh and blood. In a further speech he railed against aliens who have no British blood in them who are receiving the hospitality of Britain. Such aliens, though, would surely have been hard-pressed to recognise attitudes like his as fine examples of British hospitality. Pitkin's flesh and blood theme was appropriated later in July that year by the BUF's leading propaganda officer, Raven Thompson, and his fellow street corner demagogues at a series of open-air meetings in the East End shortly after they announced that they would be contesting seats in the district at the next local elections. The speakers saluted their audiences. You English are blood of our blood, flesh of our flesh. And they warned, the gloves must be taken off. It is Gentiles v Jews, white man v black man. In late 1936, it became increasingly common for BUF speakers to refer to their audiences as superior white men. William Joyce emphasised the racial character William Joyce, who was one of the, the, the leading ideologues, probably even more hardline than Mosley, um, William Joyce emphasised the racial categorisation of Jews as non-white when he warned that a dirty Negroid Jewish culture is sweeping over the country. BUF speakers at Duckett Street Limehouse in the summer of 1936 sought to dehumanise Jews by labelling them rats and vermin from the gutters of Whitechapel, borrowing phraseology that was popularised in Nazi Germany. At a street meeting in Bethnal Green, William Joyce declared, Jews are oriental sub-men, an incredible species of subhumanity, a type of subhuman creature. It was in the more salubrious surroundings of Hampstead Town Hall that Joyce described Jews more graphically as crawling vermin and simians with prehensile toes. He wasn't praising their agility. If rank and file members of the BUF had trouble keeping up with precisely which animal the Jews were most akin to, and whether they possessed two, four or six legs, they would have been further confused by a BUF speaker called Perrin addressing a meeting of 250 supporters in September 1936 when he ventured that politicians were all under the control of Jewish finance, a giant octopus which is gradually extending its tentacles all over the British Empire, squeezing the last drops of blood of the British people. 